and test back. So I will give a test back to whoever test. One test that is James Patrick. James, yes, yes, yes. Uh, you are okay. And then we have another one and that is oh, that uh, you yeah. gave me that. Yeah. Oh, let's that put it down then. Yeah, no. And then we have another one which came in there that is Purdy Simon Simon Purdy. You can't hear right now, not here. So we put that down there too. So we don't have to talk about it. And then we have one more. And that is um, that is Altamimi. Altamimi. It's not here neither, right? No. So that we put it down there. Okay, that's all I got, right? And now I have yours, and we put that too down there. Very good. All together. Yeah, put them all together. Wonderful. Thank you for your papers, but we don't have to discuss them, right? Because our friends are not here yet. Very good. Okay, test number two will be on March 12, from March 12 to March 19. And then the last one will be maybe the first and second week of April. It will be the same thing. So those of you who gave me something, you chose the questions. That's fine. But you can also concentrate on form Habermas and write an essay on that. Try to leave that open to you. Um, then we have a last lecture on Pope Francis on Monday night, and everybody's invited there. Dustin is always there, David is always there, everybody's invited. Then we have a visit to the mosque after the break. So as you were invited for the, for the Jewish people, as so the Catholics, and now we go to the to the mosque people there, and you can come. We haven't don't have the date yet. It will be two weeks after the break. Then contemporary issues. Do we have any contemporary issues which have something to do with the critical theory or that we can apply categories of the critical theory to it in terms of a time diagnosis or time prognosis? Probably should tell about what's going on in Ukraine. Yeah, right. Okay, we can start with this. Um, uh, what is going on in the Ukraine? I think we discussed it a little bit already. We had some kind of a, you know, an idea of a, a notion of history. So, you know, if we start with Hegelian thinking, and Fromm does, and Habermas does, and so on, and we have it on, on a road map, right? So you have the family, you have the uh, civil society, you have the state, and then you have history. So it's always important in the discussions, you know, in which dimension we are. For instance, um, Habermas uh, stopped history. That means he cut out the whole category of history. He somehow replaced it by evolution. The critical theorists in Frankfurt were upset by the whole thing. But um, the, uh, when we go back, he's a Hegelian, of course, and Hegel said, the only thing what we can learn from history is that we cannot learn anything. And the reason for that is that every new situation, like say Cochrane now, you may say some similarities before, right? Some people say, is that the Cold War starting again? So then they take an event which took place 60 years ago and think there's a similarity. Or uh, are we now in the West in the same situation like the fall of Rome? And there are people who say this. But Hegel would say, and so does Habermas, obviously, that every situation is so new uh, that, and it's so unsimilar to all the previous ones that you cannot really learn anything from the past. Uh, that means also, if you're like Benjamin, for instance, would say, we remember the past, and so on. Hegel would say that this remembrance is so pale uh, against the actuality of the moment in which decisions have to be made that the memory does not help very much. So, um, therefore, uh, Habermas said may be one reason that he went into those areas, and he reconstructed Hegel in terms of linguistics, uh, that he went into those areas where one can learn something. So maybe in terms of private rights, in terms of personal morality, in terms of the family, one can learn something. Maybe even in civil society, maybe in the state, and so on. So where, where it becomes very difficult to learn something is the historical process. 
but it is also the most terrible type of dimension because the states behave toward each other in a much more horrible and cruel way, and we can see this with the Ukraine, in a much more uh, animal-like way than individuals do inside of the state because there's the administration of justice. They are put into prison if they do something. Nobody puts the state into prison. So, so if you want to put Hitler into prison, you have to have a world war. So um, therefore, it could be you know, that Habermas was just uh, overwhelmed by, uh, by this you know, uniqueness. Now, from not so much there. He would say, you know, there was the kingdom of God, there was the kingdom of progress, and now we need the kingdom of being. So somehow we can learn from the others. That means we can uh, supersede whatever was good in the kingdom of God of the Middle Ages. We should preserve this faith and so on. But whatever was good in the age of science and so on, we should preserve this. Then, you know, the dialectical thinking, really, um, which means to negate, but also to preserve and elevate and so on. In that case, there would be learning involved then. So um, that's something peculiar. And we want to look at some books there of form today. And then we shift over more to Habermas and look at some books from him and the Hornet and so on after the break. So, nevertheless, back to our crisis in the Ukraine there. Putin ordered troops um, to his border with Ukraine. That is important. Um, speculations, and I have to translate here, on Yanukovych, Yanukovych which is uh, where he is. Nobody knows. So the government, he... He moved out with his furniture, and he went to the airport to his private plane, and then they didn't let him go because he didn't have the papers uh, to fly outside of the country, and so he went back again, and now they don't know where he is. Uh, he could be in a bunker close to the Russian border. He could also be on the sea. He has a yacht, and so he may swim around in the sea and may go to Turkey, for instance, that is a place which may take him. And he may also be in the desert. He has been seen in some of the Arabic states, but that's very unlikely. Nobody thinks that he's there. Where do you think he would most likely go? Because he was in the Crimea where he disappeared because he was trying to get to Sevastopol. Crimea was one of the things. Yeah, right. Sevastopol is the Russian harbor. Right. And so uh, all the people, they, they have rebelled too today in the Crimea. You know, the Russians, there are lots of Russians no. there. And they want to be with the homeland, you know, with the, with the Russians. So um, he may have gone there. That would be a likely place. Or going to Russia itself. Right? So, right. That would uh, be easy to go from the Crimea to the right, Russian right. territory. But the astonishing, right. yes. I mean, I mean, the Crimea, they will take care of him. They, right. I mean, the Russian population is so dense that he would be saved there. But there are others, too, and they move back against each other today. So, uh, so Russia would be the safest place to go. But the astonishing thing is that peace now, whatever the armistice, was established by the German and the French foreign minister who flew to Kiev. And he was not deposed by them. Part of the treaty which they made was that he would stay in office and then there would be another election and so on. So, but it seems that the mob on the street, on the independence place, and I was there, Twelve years ago, I stood there and they shouted and screamed and so on, um, that they demanded revenge because 70 people were killed uh, from the side of the demonstrators. And so they want him to go to Den Haag, uh, want to, to try him in the country, and so the, the, they want to re take revenge on him, and that is probably why he went. But that is not part of the treaty. According to the treaty, he could be there. There are other things in Austria, I think, a friend of his, they all put their capital outside of the country. You have to see, that's not a socialistic country anymore. That's a capitalistic country. So the, the governing people, they put their, their wealth somewhere else, in the Switzerland and Austria and so on. So they have a lot of wealth in Austria. But when he goes to Austria, then he had, may be delivered to Den Haag, to, uh, to the war criminal trial, which is the succession of the Nuremberg trial, of which we want to see maybe some, some scenes there. <laughs> okay, so that is Yanukovych. Yanukovych is a Russian name, of course. And um, then there we have uh, the Ukraine. 
And uh, the European Union wants to give money to the um, to the Ukraine. The Ukraine is part of the NATO. That is an interesting thing. It wants to be part of NATO, isn't it? Well, it's a part of NATO, yeah. And that is, of course, a threat, you know, to to Russia, because it's right in its flank. And Russia protested against it, but they did it anyway. So now the Europeans want to give them 19 billion dollars, but something has happened. They have invited Russia to participate in that plan. Now that could be insult over insult. Now here we can sometimes at least take some comparisons from history. Um, in 1945-46, the Marshall Plan was offered also to East Germany, and East Germany rejected it because it would be a way to make it capitalistic. And then it was offered to the Soviet Union too, and the Soviet Union also rejected it because it was a means, or that, that's what they thought, was a means to bring, uh, you know, make it into a liberal society again, to make a socialist society into a liberal society, a capitalist thing bourgeois society again, and so they rejected it then, and it probably must be uh, expected that the Russians will will reject that uh, again, and so it looks so nice, right? So we want to be inclusive, we want to include, but what is left out is that they are already in the flank of Russia with the NATO, and that this, when they do this, and even when they say, you know, it must be autonomous and uh, and so on and so on. Um, if the Western influence, and we saw that in Kiev, the Lufthansa has built the whole airport there and another airport, and the airplanes are all Western and and so on and so on. If that increases, of course Russia loses influence on this territory right in its flank. And so we have Russia, then we have the Ukraine, and then we have this the Russian fleet, and down there, so part of the Black Sea is under the control of the of the Russian fleet and, uh, and and the Ukraine is right in between uh, these two parts and so um therefore we'll see so he has mobilized the troops put in and they're all along the border and he of course didn't say the truth neither he said yeah we just have to try out if we can defend ourselves and so have to make some maneuvers or whatever Okay, so that is um, that is far as the Ukraine is concerned, and it's still cooking there. And we don't know if we can go in November. My family doesn't want to go along, and that is uh, interesting because uh, it is of a poor area. Now they are close to bankruptcy, and it smells like poverty. And so, when I take one of my children along, and they find a, a, a bug there in the bed, a bed bug, and so on. They will not go into this hotel ever again. So we had that Dubrovnik. One of my sons found a bed bug in, in Hotel Lero where I went for 20 years and there's no way they would go into Lero again. Then the hotels there in, in, the, in the Ukraine, they look Stalinistic. So when they smell the rats there, so they will never go there again. And, and then they, uh, there is a lack of civility so some of my daughters, you know, think they um, they cannot handle that because uh, they, they are not unfriendly uh, as such, but um, but they are a little bit tougher somehow, and uh, they push you around without wanting to push you around. So they let me in the wheelchair, they let me stand in the icy snow outside and didn't even notice it, and they put me on the wrong plane, and then they took me out again, and and then the operators of these machines, you know, they're just simple working people, and so my children, they want to deal with middle class people and working people, that they are strange people for them, so it's a, I don't know what I did in my education. You can <laughs> see that the... Every time I've gone with yeah, right. You can <laughs> see that the culture, the culture is much more important than what the poor children, <laughs> what the poor parents can do. You'll find out about this right, sooner or later. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, nevertheless, what we um, want to go back to is, of course, our perspective, right? The critical theory, which comes from the idealist and uh, historical idealism and historical materialism and so on. Um, and Marx himself never thought much of the Slavic world. He thought, you know, they were so far backward that nothing could be done with them. But he was much friendlier toward the American world. He wrote in the New York Times and the Chicago paper and so on. 
um, Hegel and Goethe both uh, thought that the Slavic world and the American world would go in the foreground, but their sympathy were all for the American world. The American Revolution had just taken place in 1776, and there was a new spirit, and um, they did practically what the French wanted to do and did only 30 years, 20 years later. So um, there was a very friendly disposition toward, uh, toward the United States. But according to this, you know, you have to jump over Habermas and so on, uh, who doesn't have any philosophy of history anymore. But if we take the philosophy of history, which Horkheimer still had and Adorno still had, um, then they are now in the foreground. Uh, that means they are the leaders of the world historical process, like Egypt was once, like Babylon was once, like China was once, and so on. They all were at the front once. And they're the nations who are in front, they have a particular responsibility. They also have a higher right than the others. So they can spy on the others, like Merkel and, and, and the French and so on, uh, because they are responsible for everybody. And, and the others have somehow the duty to help them. So uh, all the German, you know, the people there, the SS colonel who took, took us to the moon and so on, that was all stolen from, from Europe. But that is legitimate somehow that the front runner inherits what the others have uh, done. It's also possible that the front runner bombs the others into the Stone Age. That's a possibility too. And that has happened in Iraq, where we all come from. I mean, that is where Abraham was and, and so on. So um, the, uh, they, they destroy what is behind them. So there are two possibilities. They can learn from what is behind them. Uh, because um, I had this discussion today with Katya. And I told Katya, you know, take Fromm's uh, book there, Dogma of Christ, because that's what she wants to do. And I said, then you don't have to um, create all these uh, these um, categories, you know. I mean, it took uh, c categories which we take today for granted, you know, like being and cause and fact or whatever. They all have to be discovered. And it took uh, 10,000 of years of the work of the human spirit to get all these things which we take for granted, these categories. And Katya said, well, I'm, an, I'm not below from, I create my own categories. I said, you'll never be finished when you create your own categories. <laughs> Categories. It's just not, not possible. We are standing on the shoulders of other people. And so uh, now it's uh, sometimes, you know, also I think Obama said that, that capitalists sometimes think, you know, they did it all, force. I created this and so on. In reality, of course, 70,000 workers created it, you know, and he had something to do with it, but without them, he would have been absolutely nothing. So um, that's a little bit a strange type of a view of things. So, so this. Uh, um, uh, according to that philosophy of history, uh, it is important that those two, uh, they can compete with each other, these two worlds, as long as they don't kill each other off. And uh, some of that offer of the European Union may be, uh, may be serious, that they want to be rather inclusive as far as the uh, Slavic world is concerned. They belong to the uh, European world, the world which is disappearing. And um, so we mentioned that before. What do we do with the Ukraine? Ukraine should really be part of the Slavic world and of the European world. So, but they try with these 19 billion dollars to pull it into the European world, which would be backward historically. So uh, we don't know what the Russian. The Russians have uh, somehow diminished their support to the Ukraine, and I don't know exactly what that means. Maybe as a punishment or what they did to that president, or whatever. <coughs> so, nevertheless, we can see step by step, Hegel would have said, you can see providence at work from one speech act to the other of the anchor men, uh, the tensions which rise, and uh, to what extent people say, you know, Putin's a dictator or what. In, in these words, the tensions are expressed, how these words relate to words relate uh, themselves to each other. <coughs> so, if you have, you know, this philosophy of uh, um, history, then then one is not so lost, because every event is unique, but every event is a step in a certain direction. And the direction would be that they, these two worlds, you know, are able to reconcile something. Uh, we are characterized by tremendous antagonisms and one antagonism is that between personal autonomy and universal solidarity. And to get this together, to reconcile that, that would be the real ethical task 
of both of these worlds. And in this sense, they could compete. So um, when we, you know, don't have uh, a minimum wage, or we don't uh, cut the food stamps, or um, or we uh, we don't give people as we just cut all the we need uh, unemployment compensation. Then we see, you know, that we emphasize this uh, this uh, issue of personal autonomy, personal freedom. People should work hard, industrious, and so they get up and, and so on and so on. So that we see a tremendous lack of solidarity. The whole resistance against Obamacare uh, shows that there is no solidarity there whatsoever. And the neoliberals are only uh, uh, preaching that. But it is much wider spread than they. They appeal to something which is part of our atomistic, individualistic culture, where we just don't get it, and so on. So that would be a sign that we are not progressing in this direction. Um, on the other hand, when Putin, for instance, said that singer free or that uh, tycoon, um, then he shows some openness, at least, for that principle of autonomy. So yes, you can unfold your, unfold yourself, your initiative, you can create a business, and so on, and so on. But there are limit to it now. You cannot take over the store like it is here, and so on. So um, you cannot monetize the whole system, and so there are limits to it. But so both will have to balance it. But you can see uh, now we will see, you know. If he follows the principle of of, of, uh, of uh, solidarity, you know, he may very well march into the Ukraine in the extreme case, right? So he will say, you know, there are all these Russians there, the whole East Pistabas, Russian, the whole Ukraine, uh, Crimea, and so on. I have to rescue my my countrymen or whatever. That would be an extreme type of a thing, and it really we question um, the Europeans, uh, you know, notice that that would be a real equation. That means. It would be more solidarity than ever, and it would not uh, an, be an appreciation of, uh, of autonomy, neither of individuals nor of states, and, and their own sovereignty, as this is called. So, uh, so um, we can, if you take those fundamental categories, which we have not created, but which have been developed in the last 6,000 years or so, then we have some kind of a measure to look at every individual um, act which these two words commit from day to day, and we can wait what will happen tomorrow, um, and you can see a direction in the whole thing, and it makes sense. It is not so chaotic or so as people may think. Okay, so anything else about the Ukraine? Um, Ukraine and Putin and Yanukovych, he will, he will appear somewhere. Some people said he was dead already, but it's not unlikely. It's not and then we have the Ukraine the European Union now, and with the AIDS money. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I mean, they, they, there are these people who made that rebellion. Who are they? Well, the uh, the Russians said there is a neo-fascism there. Mm -hmm. Right. Neo-fascist party, and that they played a role. And besides that shooting in the leg, there is another thing which came up. The synagogue was burned down in, Ki in Kiev. So um, the Nazis burned it down. They, they just built it in 2012. Mm -hmm. It was built and it was the place where the Jews were collected in order to be killed by the SS men. I think I told you that when 12 years ago I came on a Sunday in November and it was the Sunday in which the SS had marched in you know, several years earlier and they right away killed 180 Jews there and I thought that was all, and then I found out that there was a quarry close by uh, where they killed uh, 36,000 Jews, machine gunned them down. And then, very recently, half a year ago, a German woman discovered an album in her family with her father's picture. Her father was a pilot on the Eastern Front who took pictures of battlefields and whatever. And he flew over this quarry but he did not take photos of the dead people. He took photos of their clothing, which was laying beside the quarry. And uh, so they are there now, though there is a documentation in a eerie way, uh, new documentation of the whole thing. So, so there was anti-Semitism before the fascist anti-Semitism. There was an orthodox, uh, orthodox anti-Semitism and a Christian anti-Semitism too. So there are centuries, centuries of this uh, anti-Jewish type of a thing, and now it 
it wakes up again in this uh, fascist thing. So that is the constituency of the people who rebelled. You know, they, I don't think they all have to be fascists or whatever. They may be simply liberals in many ways. So and have uh, the Polish people have European tendencies. The Croats have European tendencies. There are some Slavic people who are very fond of Europe, their culture, and so on. I mean, I thought if I go to Croatia or go to the to Ukraine, you know, with my German origin they would hate my guts or whatever. But it wasn't that way. And the reason is that they differentiate between culture and what people do, you know, as an army or whatever. And the appreciation of Western culture and German culture particularly is enormous. So, I mean, in, in, near Dubrovnik, there were whole villages were annihilated by the Germans. They took high schools out, shut all the teachers and the students and so on. When, when some partisans, you know, blew a train, then they took revenge in all the villages around. So you should think, you know, that people would have a tremendous hate, and it wasn't too long after the war then. So, but and I never had the slightest, uh, you know, feeling that they were anti-European or you were anti-German or whatever. So that's an amazing type of a thing. Okay, so, but, but I think that in that liberal upheaval, there may be fascists forces may have been at work, uh, hate against the Jews, hate against the, uh, um, uh, against the uh, socialism, both of it. And then maybe we can take something here, and then we come to something else later on there. Um, there has something has been uh, published by a historian here, and we can just look at this for a moment which falls into our thing, it just came out today. So that is our contemporary issue thing, which is very important because we don't want to only think historically, you know, what the critical theory did in the past, but if it's still of actuality somehow. Um, and there are prejudices, Katya thinks, you know, form is the only one people talk about. And so when you look over there in my library, you see that there are hundreds of books which are written about everybody, about, uh, uh, you know, uh, Horkheimer and Adorno and Benjamin and, and all this. So I don't know why that is uh, so that people are so uninformed or, or whatever it may be. I don't know. For the moment, I don't know. But nevertheless, there is a report here. And I want to, uh, there's a scholar who looks at the whole Hitler thing. We had the Hitler movie the last time. So, and uh, the... Uh, what they charge there over how they explain the Holocaust and, and so on is um, that the Germans were overwhelmed by a paranoiac fantasy. Now, paranoia is a mental illness. Uh, it is an illness where you think that you are persecuted all the time. So um, when I was a prisoner and I was sent home as an anti-Nazi, I was sent home and there was one soldier in the group. We, we were free, I mean, we put on, on animal cars, but the doors were open, and so uh, and we were in tents without barbed wire and so on. But there was one colleague there of mine, one soldier, and he, when he was, uh, when we were in investigated, he had said that he wasn't a Nazi, that he was an anti-Nazi, and he was a Nazi. So he had lied. And this lie was somehow uh, uh, developed into a mental illness. So when we were in the tent one night, he jumped up and he uh, screamed that I wanted to kill him, that I had a knife and wanted to cut his throat and so on. So an officer came in and of course I had no knife and I was just sleeping and so on. So he had that feeling that somebody was persecuting him. And then when we drove by Paris in an open train there with a little stove to keep us warm and so on, he suddenly got up and jumped out of the open door into into the fields out there. The train wasn't going too fast, that was good. And he was was caught then and was brought back into, into the camp again. So uh, that would be the genesis of a paranoia, that, uh, you know, you were not honest about it. He had to expect that he would be released to his village where everybody knew that he had been a fascist and so on. So there were fears and guilt feelings or whatever it was, uh, he developed this paranoid thing. So that is the illness. And so the theory of these historians here is 
that um, and and I think uh, that Adorno and uh, Horkheimer would also talk about this paranoia, yeah, and you can find it already. Um, if it is that, you can find it in my struggle, Hitler's my struggle. Uh, that means he had a vision by providence, and uh, that uh, the Jews were the main enemy, and that the Aryans and the Germans had a right to defend themselves. So he saw the whole thing as a self-defense issue. So to do away with the communists uh, and, and the Jews inside of Germany was one step, and Barbarossa was another step to free yourself. So the question which the historians raised here is, um, are the, is the annihilation of the Jews and Barbarossa, the war against the communists, are these two separate issues which have nothing to do with each other? And my point was always, and that's what they affirm here, they did have something to do with each other. It was the same struggle. But um, was it a paranoia? Um, a paranoia means only that somebody feels persecuted if he is not persecuted. So the question is, you know, what, where are they persecuted? And so on. Or uh, if the paranoia, what are the real elements in the paranoia? Is there something real in the paranoia? Because if you are persecuted and you feel that you are persecuted, then you are not paranoid. You are only paranoid when you feel persecuted and uh, you are not, really. So, but, um, so that, that would be to be explored there and, and uh, that we have already in my current struggle and it became uh, bigger and bigger as the struggle, the war went on and so on. This so-called paranoia became stronger and stronger. Now, what could be the real elements? The real elements could be that the war got lost, the First World War was lost, and that Rothschild financed that war, and that already the First World War was an attempt of the Jews to destroy Germany. That's how they interpreted it. When he was blinded by, by the British gas war, Hitler was in the hospital, and three Jewish fellows came and uh, and told them, told the group there that an armistice had been concluded and uh, the war was over and the emperor had left and so so the Jews were the messengers of the whole thing that may have played a role and then there was the Versailles Treaty there was before Wilson's peace conference in Paris and uh, and and Wilson had to fight horribly against Clemenceau the chief of the French because Clemenceau said that Wilson was German friendly. Uh, because they wanted to take Elsa's Lorraine, and Wilson said, out of the question. He said, I made this promise, there would be no territorial uh, conquering or whatever. Elsa's Lorraine belongs to Germany, and you cannot take it. And Clemenceau was shouting and screaming against each other. But then Clemenceau gave in. And uh, so he, uh, at least he could, Wilson could limit it to some extent. But then uh, he, they were strong anti-German feelings and, and so the Versailles Treaty was made in a railroad car and it was a very harsh type of a, of a, of a, free, a, peace, conf, a peace deal uh, and, and um, the uh, Germans had dictated one in Russia which was much more brutal even than the, the Versailles Treaty but the Versailles Treaty was always the point, speaking point of Hitler every speech he st started with that and it was felt that it was uh, very anti-German and that it was driven by Jewish forces. Max Weber, by the way, was part of this, of this uh, uh, conference there. So, uh, nevertheless, the, uh, that is what is in the background here. The German people were faced with the struggle of their existence for their annihilation. So the feeling was that the, the Jews wanted to annihilate the Aryan race and, and so on. Having succeeded, defeating enemies within Germany had been now turned to defeating Germany's external enemies. Each, however, was part of the same struggle of life against death or to be or not to be from Hamlet there. Hitler and Nazis um, had no other choice than to fight the Jewish enemy which was working to cause the, ex the disintegration of Germany and of Western civilization and there was a tremendous inflation and a tremendous depression and 
all that the Jews were were uh, blamed for that were, were behind it. Uh, not the Jewish little guy, but rather the Jewish high finance that was Rothschild, you know, from Frankfurt. On July 24, 1944, that's one year before the war ended, the party Reich Propaganda Directorate uh, distributed a pamphlet entitled Germany has entered the fight to the death with the Jewish Bolshevik system of murder. Jewish Bolshevik system, here you have it. The Jews and the socialists, right? To guide local Nazi party speakers, propagandists and officials, the invasion of the Soviet Union had brought clarity on the Germans. Now we recognize our old enemy, world Jewry. After being defeated within Germany, Jewry was embodied in Anglo-Saxon plutocracy and Bolshevik state capitalism. So now you have the Jews on both sides. You know, why did Roosevelt decide against Ford and uh, against uh, neutrality? Because the Jews were in the White House. And the same thing was in Moscow. The Jews had been very active during the revolution, and so socialism was Jewish, and a plutocracy here was Jewish as well. Um, uh, echoing Hitler's view, you, you have over here, when you can look at this, the back, you have the four volumes of the International Jew by Henry Ford, right? That was the same, same spirit. Echoing Hitler's view, the pamphlet asserted that World War was an extension of the war that National Socialism had waged against its internal enemies. The Social Democrats and Communists against which the Nazis had struggled in their rise to power now were manifest as Soviet Bolshevism and Anglo-Saxon plutocracy. These were the enemies. Each uh, ruled by Jews who thought world domination. That is the uh, thing of the elders of Zion, the, the story, which you also have over there. It's a little red pamphlet which the uh, Secret Service, uh, uh, Russian Secret Service, fabricated in Paris. Uh, Hitler and Ford knew from a Frankfurt newspaper in Sun that it was a fraud, but they said it was done by a Jew anyway. It was a fraud, but it was a fraud done by a Jew. And that points out in detail how Jews want to take over power, how they want to take over the press, how they get into the Fed, like Greenspan and so on how they get into Wall Street, how they get in the newspapers, and so on and so on. So if you were a Nazi, you would look, when you look at television, you know, wherever a Jew appears. And very often, you know, when you have economic reports particularly, it's Jewish. But Americans are not trained. Americans are trained to differentiate between black and white, but, but not between uh, Aryans and Semites. So, except when the Arabs come, suddenly they see that they are Semites. But with the Jews, they were somehow successful to neutralize, except in the law schools and in the, uh, in the um, uh, medical schools. So we have both schools now on campus soon. We will have to be careful about this. Nazism grew out of a vast paranoid fantasy about Jewish destructiveness. Germany rose up to defend itself and Western civilization against the cosmic threat posed by Jews. The Holocaust was undertaken in order to exterminate the Jews. Similarly, Operation Barbarossa was undertaken as a war ex of extermination. Additionally, Germany had to fight against the United States and Great Britain because these nations, too, were controlled by the evil enemy world Jewry. Of course, none of this makes any sense at all. David Walker, the historian, without wishing to put too light, a touch on things says that National Socialists were weird. Oh, that's a very weird concept. Indeed, one would be justified in saying that Nazi beliefs about the Jews were nonsense. However, when one is possessed by paranoid fantasies and anxiety, reality goes by the board. The Nazis are against the Jews, but both the Holocaust and the Second World War was generated by the same paranoid delusion. So, further um, exploration you know, is, first of all, Frankfurt School First Generation, they were all Jews. Uh, they were hated in the Café Marx. They were all born in Frankfurt. Um, they were thrown out. The institute was confiscated. Horkheimer's home in the Taunus Mountains was taken as an SA. Headquarter was expropriated, too. They had to flee to Switzerland. Otherwise, they would have been part of this gassing. And uh, Karl Landauer course, died in the concentration camp. There were some others who are uh, less known who also went under 
in the, in the whole process. So that is why we have to see them in this context. You know, if they had not fled, they would be the victims of the Holocaust. On the other hand, do they fit into that picture which the Nazis have? They were responsible, you know, for saying against their own Jewish people, Morgenthau was in the cabinet of Oswald, and he wanted to sterilize all the Germans and make Germany into an agricultural uh, society, completely agricultural, no industry, and so on. And he was uh, overruled by the Oswald administration, and the Frankfurt School people and the New School in, in New York uh, could influence through Mrs. Roosevelt to say not all Germans were Nazis. We want to awaken the old democratic thing, maybe in Germany or uh, whatever was good in the Weimar Republic. Uh, we, we want to see there are a lot of people who were not Nazis and so on. And so they developed a re-education program for Germany and for the um, army here. Uh, 300,000 Germans were here, the Africa Corps, and I was became part of it too, and 100 thousand Italians and so with the Germans they made that re-education program and they sent them back 20,000 of them to uh, re-democratize Germany and to uh, make the transition from a fascist state into a uh, uh, into a liberal state again, constitutional state. Okay? Is there an issue? I feel like you can let that go so that you can look at it a little bit. These, these people that argue that there was paranoia and all yeah. that stuff isn't there a, a sort of, aren't they missing a link in that they are sort of setting up Nazi anti-Semitism on, as something completely unique when the, the, the process of mm -hmm. anti-Semitism in Europe has such a long history? I mean, right, I know yeah. there's the, 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 I can't, he's in the documentary show, and he's a Jewish historian, he says really only the final solution is unique to Nazism, all the yeah. other things, the ghettoization, the mass Yeah, what's well, all there before. All yeah. there before, it's not. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, that is his thesis, you know, this historian, paranoia. And I think it was to some extent also in Horkheimer and, and Adorno and so on. So now, you know, in order to look at this thesis or, you know, diminish it or whatever, one would have find, find such realistic elements and say, you know, if he was uh, paranoid, then the others must have been paranoid too. Uh, you know, why Why did the Russians, the Spanish, and so on and so on, why did they, every Good Friday, uh, they went there and destroyed villages and raped Jewish women and, and, uh, and destroyed their property in the ghetto and so on, and that went on practically for a thousand years and so on. Now, uh, could we say, you know, that the Christians who did this were paranoid, that the Jews were, you know, were after them or whatever? I mean, the Jewish threat, you know, not so much physically or so, is that they do not accept the uh, Jesus as the Messiah. He was one of many false pseudo-messiahs who lived at that time, before him and after him. And from has described this beautiful in the dogma of Christ. So if you want to read that, you can see all the messiahs which were there, and of which Jesus was only one, one of them. So the Jewish thesis that Jesus was one of the pseudo messiahs who was considered to be a messiah, but then it was clear that he wasn't because he died and was dead, you know. And the Christian message is then, yes, he was dead, but he was resurrected, and he went to the Father, and he will come again, and so on. That is why this one messiah somehow survived, by all the others were uh, deprived of their title later on. So, And that could be, of course... Uh, felt by the Christians as a threat which went to the very substance and uh, that the Jews did not convert could be interpreted that way too uh, in a certain sense so either Hitler was not so paranoid or the others who did similar things were also pa paranoid, so that is a possibility um, but we also have to see you know um, when Hitler and these people there perceived the Jews as such an enemy who went to the very substance of Germans, what data are there? What did Rothschild really do? Did he already invest in the 1870 war on the other side? Did he invest in the 1914 war on the other side? Um, the, Hitler said that if the Jewish people would, uh, would somehow motivate
made once more a totally uh, suicidal war like they had done in the First World War. So somehow they had the impression that the Jews were behind these two wars before and the Second World War. And so, so if we want to decide is the paranoia or not, that's a social psychological problem. We have to see, you know, if they saw something or not, if there was something or not. I mean, there were millions of Jews in Germany who were more German than the Germans. My Jewish friend Gregory Baum said, if they hadn't, he fled from Berlin, he said, if they hadn't, annihilated them uh, you know, had not done that anti-Semitism uh, all the Jews would have been on his side on the fascist side they liked the German football players much better than the French one and so on and I found some here and I think the murderous thing what was done to them was that they felt so completely German and then they were told you are not German suddenly and uh, so that is, you know, to decide. We, we don't have to decide this paranoia or not. But what is behind that repetitive statement in the Reichstag, and that means in the, uh, in the uh, Berlin government, if the Jewish high finance will once more instigate a war among Europeans, that will not be the end of Europe. It will be the end of the Jewish race. Okay, but there is now something else behind all this, and that is equality. We mentioned that already, right? Um, socialism, in its radical form, is for equality. Equality means classless. According to liberalism, there is no equality. The only equality is that of opportunity. So you may, may get the opportunity to work from, move from the working class to the middle class, by going to Western Michigan University and so this opportunity is there. But there is no uh, uh, removal of the class boundaries or whatever. They are there. They will not be mentioned. Uh, we are not talking about My mother, you know, came from the working class. My father came from the middle class. And my mother never allowed me to say class because she had suffered so much. She was rejected by the middle class relatives because she was a stenographer and so on. Um, she was also not Catholic. She had to, had to convert and so on. So it was such a wound in her. So class stuff can go to people's nerves. And therefore it's maybe wise in this country that unlike the British, we don't emphasize it at all. Unfortunately, it is there nevertheless. And it penetrates also our language in Congress and so class envy, uh, class warfare. This Obama is a socialist because he produces class warfare. And so, on. so it is repressed and it is there after all. And, uh, and the reality is simply there that we are different classes. So uh, the, um, therefore the gospel, the Jewish Christian gospel, that we have been created equal, we have all been created equal, and therefore we should be equal in reality. That is the culprit. So this is not only a paranoid thing now, that is a theological thing and a philosophical thing. We are all created, God created us equal. Um, now in this struggle with the homosexuals there, of course the same people who say God created us equal also said, God created us men and women and uh, made us one and what God and so on and so on that's against divorce but men and women is against the whole homosexual thing so that is the fundamental principle but we can leave that aside for a moment in spite of the fact that in Honduras they introduced the death penalty against homosexuals um, and then transformed it into a life, uh, lifelong sentence and in the, Soviet Un uh, in the um, Russian Federation they also have a law against homosexuals which is very less strict and we have it of course among our religious groups here too and we have it in the state there where the governor <coughs> which state Arizona Arizona where the governor has to decide today or tomorrow if she will uh, uh, support a bill 
which allows owners of restaurants to keep the uh, gay people out because um, there were incidences and they have this law now that the owner can say I do not serve gay people as they once said I do not uh, serve black people but it is of course a difference now between the gay problem and the black problem one is the race thing the other one is the gender thing and so but nevertheless, the, the, everybody waits now what she will decide about this whole thing. Okay, nevertheless, this principle that all people are created equal and therefore should be equal, that is what the communists and the Jews and the real Christians have in common. That is a principle which will ruin the whole species. You have that already in my struggle there, in my uh, uh, thing there. So, he replaced that then with the aristocratic law of nature, predator and prey. Nobody is equal in nature. Everybody eats everybody, and therefore humanity is part of nature. Therefore, this equality is against nature. And if we act against nature, and when the Jews and the Bolsheviks and so on do that, they will ruin the human species. We have to fight for the human species. So. It's not only that the Jews and the Christians are that they destroy, you know, uh, capitalism or whatever, uh, but they destroy the whole humanity. Not only the Aryans, they destroy everybody. So that's how serious the whole thing is now. Now, is that paranoid? You know, the um, that is a religious doctrine. You know, which it's a word of God or whatever. Um, so one has to be a little bit careful with this whole thing. And the Jews and the Christians were the Bolsheviks, so they said in the, in the Waldschanze there, uh, the Bolsheviks of the Roman Empire, they destroyed the Roman Empire, that's the proof. Now he fought against the Jews and the Bolsheviks and so on, uh, at the Eastern Front, and, and uh, that was in order to rescue not only the Roman Empire, but to rescue the whole human species. Now, is that part of a paranoid system? You know, that uh, we don't have to decide, but, uh, you know, if we, uh, maybe it was not only paranoia now, you know, the, because the Jewish people and the Christians and the Muslims, they all teach that, that we are fundamentally all equal. Now, then they made compromise, they all had slaves, they all had serfs, and so on. So, in reality, they acted a little bit different, but uh, ideally, that was the word of Allah, that was the word of Yahweh, that we were all equal. And it uh, seems to undermine the very fact that communists were having some certain amount of success in Germany. Like yeah. in Munich, yeah. the Klasse Republic or something. Right, you know? Re 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 Republic, yeah. Right. yeah. And there was clearly, you know, the, the majority of the communist leadership was Jewish. Yeah, Germany. right, yeah. And so to say it's simply paranoid you know, which would mean that, that, that somehow they weren't being successful, they weren't yeah. undermining, say, bourgeois success in yeah. society, whatever. and they clearly were, and they had a yeah. certain benefactor in, in the Soviet Union that was working with them. Yeah. I mean, I, were they paranoid, or were they yeah. just on guard? Yeah, I mean, we cannot say, you know, that the principle of equality is in itself a paranoid system, that means in reality we are all equal, but there are some people who think we are still unequal. They want to go against fascism, against capitalism, and so on and so on. But we are already equal, or whatever. That could be, that could be constructed, you know, some kind of a paranoid system. But the reality is that there is this revelation, you know, we are created that way, and then there is this reality, you know, and there are the people who say. We must push the reality to the point of this ideal. So we should have a class of society. And I don't think that this could just be seen as a paranoid system or whatever, right? In, in, in one's head, I mean, in people's head. Because uh, we would have to pull, we would have to call a lot of things paranoid then, which we consider to be normal usually. Okay. Well, I just wanted to show you this thing. So it's coming up daily, you know, these things, and uh, it's amazing. So another thing which I, I put this put in here in the background. Here is a beautiful picture there. This is a Syrian refugee. It's from the Spiegel in Germany. Uh, and on one side you have the swastika. On the other side you have two homosexuals holding hands. So 
they speak a little bit left wing, you know, type of a thing there. Um, there is also two homosexuals and there is a heart right above them. So these refugees come, and that's a beautiful Syrian woman there. By the way, there was a day an unbelievable, horrifying picture. A street, I think, in Damascus. And on both sides, just everything in ruins. And in the middle, thousands of people streaming toward the, toward the onlooker, all waiting for food. Hungry, you know. I mean, I mean, thousands of people, head on head on head, as far as you could look into this ruined field there and, and waiting for a little bit of food and so on. So, so she is one who has fled this disaster there. By the way, today also there were reports about uh, that there are a lot of Al Qaeda, a lot of um, warriors, jihadists, and so on, who get their training in Syria and when they come home now. One was in our island there in Cuba, was a prisoner, we released him, and then he went to uh, Syria too in order to fight there. And um, so now they, they or he wanted to go and they caught him in London and they put him back into prison again. And so, so. But um, he agitated very much against us keeping the prisoners. People thought already there was no Guantanamo Bay anymore, but uh, there still is. Obama was not successful. And so there are about 250 people there still. So, nevertheless, this is an interesting thing. So when they come into Germany, they have to be conditioned now. <laughs> they have to be educated so that they fit into the German society. Now, where she comes from, this there, the homosexual, is fat. So uh, at home, you couldn't talk about homosexuals. But when you come to Germany, you can talk about homosexuals. <laughs> you are free to do that. But as far as the swastika is concerned, in Syria she can freely talk about the swastika because there is a lot of sympathy throughout the Near East of Hitler because of the Jews and what he did to them and so on. So, but that you are not allowed to talk in Germany now. <laughs> so it's a crazy type of situation. So they go into these transition camps and there they are. So now this you must never mention. Almost, uh, this you must never mention there. But you can talk uh, freely about homosexuals and lesbians. We are an enlightened <laughs> country. <laughs> uh, just uh, let you see, this is a beautiful uh, Syrian. That would work in my dissertation. So, yeah, take it. Okay, very good. So that may be all for our. Um, then the Mexican drug lord, we can take that up there. The, the guy, the little one, is called the little one, or the short, the shorty, um, has been caught. And uh, that would be interesting for us because of the whole drug business. What kind of a society is that which is so much in need of this? So um, this guy is worldwide and he uh, uh, has searched for, looked for everywhere. Now they caught him a second time already, put him into prison. We want to have him. So, um, so we said civil society, you know, it's need system administration of justice and uh, police. So police caught this guy, the drug lord, because he delivered these tons of uh, marijuana and uh, cocaine and, and all these things. And um, so uh, the connection is we have laws against this and the, the police has to enforce these laws and this guy violated these laws. Um, the laws are regulating the needs which we can have and the needs which we cannot have um, and so he feeds needs which are really forbidden but the question is why do we have those needs uh, what, what is going on in civil society so that this warlord can exist because he can only exist because he f uh, feeds those needs if these needs would not be there, there wouldn't be a market. And if there wouldn't be a market, he couldn't be a billionaire. So how can such a guy come into existence? And he's not the only one uh, in Colombia or whatever, and, and in Afghanistan and so on. The world is full. So this stuff comes into our cities, and there are obviously buyers. And our question would be then, why? what kind of a need is that? We, we know that uh, religion is called opium of the people, so <laughs> that means Kant said, you know, that is a religion which makes us feel good, so 
and he was against it because it dulls the conscience. Uh, but why do we not feel good without it? What is it in our society which makes us feel bad so that we need that stuff all the time? And it's, of course, also alcohol and uh, cigarettes and so on, but that's more tougher stuff, the like cocaine and, and so on. <laughs> so um, that uh, would, of course, be social psychology. So that would be from, you know, and uh, uh, one thing, we discussed that, you know, that from split, uh, 1939, he was, until then, he was a member of the, of the Frankfurt School. He had contributed to the development of the critical theory very strongly in the beginning. Uh, he was sick very often, and the Institute paid all that. He continually traveled around, and he went to Switzerland, uh, and Tavos, and, and so on, for, because he couldn't breathe and was Horny, uh, uh, Karen Horny, who went with him all the time. And she was an ego psychologist, and uh, probably that is why he returned more to an ego psychology again. Um, so uh, the question, why he split in the end, one thing was he wanted to bring his mother over uh, from Germany, from Frankfurt, so that she wouldn't be killed and asked Hockham for money, and Hockham didn't give him the money. Uh, so that seems to be true. Funk says it, and uh, it's probably probably true. <laughs> but we are concerned, you know, not uh, if they... I mean, they did pay for all his travels and for all his treatment. The last time he went to Switzerland, they had developed a new medicine against tuberculosis. He had new, all those new attacks of tuberculosis, and that medicine helped him. He did never become sick again. It's amazing. So the Institute paid for all of this, but then um, they uh, didn't pay for his mother coming over. Um, they, as you know, they got their money from Weil, Kurt Weil, who was a businessman in South America, and he gave them a few million, and they built that institute which the Allies bombed out again. But they took it with them to the States, and they invested in Wall Street. And there were, of course, all these uh, crashes, and they lost a lot of money. So, uh, so they were not exactly in which that they could pay everything and so on. So, maybe they were at a low. Uh, it was the friend of uh, Alkheimer, what was his name? The close friend of his who did the economic stuff for the institute. And so, the, but so I don't know exactly if they run out of money or whatever, but they did not let his mother come over. I don't know if somebody helped, somebody else. Uh, with Bloch too, Bloch was in Czechoslovakia, and they, uh, he wanted to ask for money too, and they were willing to give it to them, but his publisher was faster, and he paid Bloch then to come to the States where he was a handy man there in the high school for all the war. Okay, so, but what is it theoretically? Now, that is important. What is theoretically is that under the influence of Horny, who did all these travels with him, he never married her or whatever. He was divorced already from another psychoanalyst whom he married, and then uh, later on uh, married Mrs. Skurland. Mrs. Skurland is the one who took Benjamin to Port Boo and was there when he died and took whatever he gave her to Adorno in America. And Mrs. Gulland's husband was a member of the uh, Kuriger Theory people in Columbia, at Columbia University. So, and afterwards she divorced her husband and she uh, then uh, from uh, uh, married her. And he married a third time, I think. So, um, that is the background. So what is the theoretical background? It has something to do with a very complicated thing about our animality, the extent to which we belong to nature, and to what extent we are beyond nature. And Freud had this uh, biological view of us, that we were fundamentally animals, and that means that we shared the instincts of the animals and then analyzed people, the dreams, and so on, in terms of these animal uh, um, forces. What Fromm 
did under uh, under the, the influence of uh, his friends or whatever or alone, and he wrote a little essay in 1933 or so, in which he made all that clear, and the institute rejected it. And he also uh, did this working class uh, experiment there, the questionnaire for 15,000 or 18,000 or whatever workers. And that didn't go well neither with the Frankfurt School people. And that may have also been uh, uh, rooted in that controversy. So he revised the Freudian theory in those terms that he looked at the animal factors, so the animal instincts in us, hunger, sex, aggression, and so on. But then he did something which Freud did not to that extent, namely to emphasize the cultural factor in modifying these instincts so that the ego could get along in society. So uh, that means you have a, a value, you know, a cultural value, for instance, profit motive. And so then this cultural element, this cultural factor, influences the instinctive factor and forms it and shapes it in certain forms, what you wish and need and so on. And that m helps you to get along in a society which is dominated by profiteering capitalists so that you will then not rebel against that, so that you will be conform. So it is a three-level thing. There is the biological level and then there is the social level, society, there's the cultural level. It's dialectical. And it comes through in the work of Fromm, Marcuse, and Horkheimer on authority and family. Authority and family, the structure is culture, society, individual. But the individual in the family. Because it is in the family that the culture values are put into the superego and are then forming the instincts. So we do have these instincts, but they are shaped and formed in terms of impulses or needs. So from calls it then instincts. He doesn't use that word instinct anymore. He uses the word um, needs or impulses. And they are a combination now of biological things, biological instincts, and cultural influences, which then help the ego to get along in the in the world around them. So if you have somebody who said, I will not work because whenever I work, I am exploited. There's a capitalist who makes profit for me. Walter's father said that all the time. Um, there, something has gone wrong now. What should happen? What should have happened is uh, what is wrong with being exploited? Uh, you cannot live without being exploited. So the culture has to transform your instinctive or need system in such a way that you do not rebel. So that you say with the culture that the profit motive, the appropriation of surplus value, is okay. And that your instinctive apparatus, your id, does not rebel against that. And if it does, you are stamped as a neurotic. <coughs> and then your social security will be very small in the end. And it's help. The liberals know that to fall down to the lowest level of society is hell. So therefore, if, you, if your instinctual apparatus now is transformed in terms of these cultural values, then your ego will be conform to the world as it is, to the capitalistic system. You will, when you are smart, you will know somehow that you may be exploited. You may not even know that. But even if they tell you, uh, somebody tells you, you are exploited, he would not rebel. He would say, so what? That is how the world is. And that is how it ought to be. Because we have this value of uh, profit motive. Another value is monotism. Another value is monogamy. So if you say, but my instincts are polygamic, 
I always want to have new women, you know. <laughs> then uh, the cultural value is monogamic. They would say, you have to pull yourself together. You can only have one. That's it. So the cultural value of monogamy transforms instincts, which as animal instincts are really polygamic. There are no monogamic instincts. They are made monogamic by the cultural influence. So that means what Fromm has against Freud is that he was too much of a biologist. Now, of course, Freud saw the cultural influence too. He had the superego and so on. So, in principle, the revision may not be so radical. But if you take a particular case now, uh, the aggression, the killer instinct. So when Freud discovered that against his will, that means clinically, empirically, in the hospitals, um, then he would come to the conclusion that this is an inheritance from our biological background. Two million years ago, we separated from the chimpanzees, but we have kept this instinctual structure in us, the id. Therefore, when he judged, for instance, the experiment of Lenin, he said, well, it's a good thing what Lenin wants to do, you know, take poverty away and then uh, you will not have wars anymore. But he distrusted it. He said, no matter what you do, this instinct will be there. Our biology will not be changed by making a change in the culture or in the social structure by expropriating the expropriators and so on. So in that sense he never became a socialist or whatever. And you see what Marcuse and Fromm do then is saying, well, such an instinct does not exist really. Uh, we become wild and kill only when our libidinous desires are frustrated. When I love her and she says no there and then I have to kill her. So, so uh, that could not be done if you follow the biologism, biologism of Freud. So this biologism is there. You could say that Freud is more down to earth. You know, he was a medical doctor, and he saw our animal organism. See, we are hungry, we need sex, and so on. It's simply there. It's a constant, and the cultural factor may bring about some modification. But in the end, it's hopeless. We will always remain these animals. And so then when, when this Nazi thing came, his friends were amazed that he took all that in Vienna. You know, Anna was pulled before the, the, the Gestapo. That's when he then left to London. And his friends said, what do you say about it? Look what they are doing, what these Nazis doing. And he would just say, so what? What do you think? <laughs> the animals. Right, so, uh, and there is a certain positive, uh, there is certain pessimism, and that's why he said, and now we are in the camp of Schopenhauer again, because Schopenhauer has that. Schopenhauer always wanted to study the natural sciences; he never got to it really. But uh, that's the same thing, you know. What is this relationship between our organism, as an animal organism, and the genome which we share? Ninety-eight percent of our genome is chimpanzee genome. So that is after Freud now. We didn't have the genome matrix at that time. So now we have it, right? We can prove it. So um, so how, how strong, you know, is that cultural factor? And, and so far as from thinks it's much powerful than the biological thing, is an idealist again. And this idealism is optimistic. And this optimism is attractive. We know of Schopenhauer from Frankfurt, right? He was in Berlin. He put his glass at the same time of Hegel, and nobody came to him. People want to have optimism. They will not lead, not like uh, pessimistic people. So that's something fundamental in us. So, I mean, is that clear now, this whole line of thought, right? So you see that their thinking is really dialectical in the sense of culture, society, and family. 
the family uh, takes the cultural value and puts them into the superego so that then people act in a conformist way. There are three types of nonconformists. One is the neurotic or the psychotic. That means the transformation of the instinctual system its civilization did not work adequately. And so compulsively, with the same power of the biological instincts, he cannot do right. That is the ill person. The other one is the criminal. The criminal is happy that other people are saving money because otherwise he could not steal it. The criminal is not under compulsion. So there is this question now when somebody says, to the judge, I've killed six prostitutes, your honor, kill me, if you let me go, I will kill more of them. That means he thinks that his id is so powerful that its ego has no choice. Then the judge will say, you have been created as a free human being, which is a myth, and therefore you are responsible. <clears throat> that means he says psychoanalytically, your ego is free enough to reject the instincts in you or the uh, uh, irritations coming from outside through your eyes and so on. You are powerful enough in that. So that is a fundamental, you know, almost three steps di dialectic like Hegel has it, right? So, um, and that is in that study there about uh, Marcuse from and Horkheimer on the family and authority. Because the authority in the family, the father particularly, is the one who takes the cultural values, democracy, monogamy, monotheism, profit myths, and puts it into the head of the children so that then their ego can function conformity. And then comes that argument. There are these black people there in Chicago. They have no father. They're all born out of wedlock. So what do you expect? That's why they're all in prison. See, there is some, in that uh, idiotic prejudices, there is some knowledge in that. And But then we have to go also beyond the critical theory, you know. What if the authoritarian thing there, that the patriarchy, uh, if that doesn't work, you know anymore. If something happens to this patriarchy and the father loses his patriarchal position as a priest, as an employer, as an educator, and just becomes the daddy, and he doesn't even sit there saying the prayers anymore on the table or whatever, and nobody really respects him. In the best case, he is a friend. In the best case, he can still pay for Western and so on. For what? He's not the beneficiary, so the capitalist should really pay. So that is the whole question which has happened since Freud, <coughs> you know, that the patriarchy uh, receded and therefore there is not this strong father who puts then these cultural values into that superego so that it guides the ego and strengthens the ego uh, in transforming habitually, habits, that's virtue, through habits to transform the libido that it doesn't wish what it ought not to wish and transforms all the aggression so that it doesn't kill when it would like to kill. And all that killing, you can now apply this, you know what that means in this society, why all this killing happens every week, every two weeks. You can wait next week, there probably is time again that somebody goes in the store and kills somebody again. So um, uh, that uh, it, it, these categories, that's what I meant today with the uh, with Katya, you know, these ca categories it takes, you know, unbelievable work of decades and centuries to get to those categories, you know, and therefore nobody can do all that by himself. He will never finish. Okay, is there any question about this now? About the, the drug lord got us there, right? Um, so... We want to take a break. Uh, would you like to? Just yeah, about yeah. If you want to, yeah. It's your course. You are the masters of the house. Are you following the stuff going on in Venezuela at all? 
Yeah, right. That is also a confusing thing, right? Is this something about the middle classes today and young people? I think Chavez was the guy, and his successor took over, right? Yeah, yeah Chavez died. Yeah, yeah, Chavez died, and now his successor is not so successful, right? Yeah, Maduro. Yeah, maybe he doesn't have the charisma. Well, there's always been issues. I mean, I mean, Venezuela has always been a hot spot, especially for. Yeah. Me. Bush went over oh yeah, right. In the early two thousands. Well, there's a lot of CIA activities probably. He is with Fidel. Yeah. Hey, don't forget the cookies. Katya would be very disappointed if her cookies had not disappeared. that? Can you buy that DVD? I didn't see the beginning. Oh, last night? Yeah. Yeah, I That's very good. Let's buy it for both of us. Okay. It's a DVD. Yep. Now, what did they say why Benedict uh, came too late? Why Benedict resigned? Um, because of that report. Report about homosexuals? Mm-hmm. And all the sex scandals that were going on and... In the Vatican. In the Vatican. In the Vatican and also the stuff that was going on with the kids. They said that he wanted to clean out the filth, as he yeah. called it. There's too much filth in the church. Um, but he just did not have the strength to yeah. fire the people oh, that yeah. needed to be fired and just yeah. couldn't do it. Okay. And so yeah. he, you know, resigned himself basically to say, I, I am not the one to do yeah. this. I can't do right. it. And that makes they're sense. all my friends. They're yeah. my well, and that was, uh, that was yeah. part of the, the issue was even his Number two guy was one of the most corrupt ones, the the yeah. foreign secretary, I think it was, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, and when they people came to him and said, look, he's got to go, he just was not going to do it. Oh. He didn't have the strength to do it. Yeah. But it sounded like like he really was after yeah. these guys who were really, oh. you know, messing around with the children and whatnot before he became pope. Yeah. Right, he was the inquisitor, so as such he would be responsible for that thing. It all came to him, mm -hmm. so they had to report to him this whole thing. Yep. But he himself did a strange thing, you know, with a priest down here in one of the states. Uh, he was 30 years old, the priest, and the, the bishop said, you know, he did this with the children, and I have to defrock him. And, uh, and then Ratzinger said, he's only 30, you know, have mercy with him. Uh, just try it again, you know. And, right. uh, and so he re-employed him again, and it happened again. Mm -hmm. Then the bishop said, "That's the end of it. Now I, I cannot hold him any longer." Right. And, and then, and then this guy, the priest, married, and in the marriage he again abused children. Right. Then he was put into prison for years. Yeah. And then he wasn't married anymore. And then so there was that that other one. I don't remember his name, but it was the founder of the Legionnaires. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, that's the famous, famous yeah, case. Yeah, who abused all those he children. He had been canonized even, right? Yeah, abused his own children. Yeah. And then because Pope John Paul the twenty or Pope John Paul II said such nice things about him, yeah. Ratzinger couldn't really do yeah. anything, even though he got all the reports. Yeah. And it looked like hundreds of kids that were yeah. abused by him. And yeah. He couldn't do anything. I mean, this is, uh, you know, that's somewhat... Uh, Believable, you know, so that they said it was old age, you know, so old age, but you know, other popes have gone on to 100, you know, so mm -hmm. there must be something else in old age, right. uh, which makes it particularly difficult, and yep. that may be very one reason. But mine is still another one, and that is that in the council, the scholastic model collapsed, Thomas Aquinas. Right. That he right. was the specialist for the church fathers, and, the father's model was, and, and that they hoped that this church father model could then maybe fill the empty space. And uh, then he did this, you know, and in spite of the fact that the church fathers had been enlightenedness, they were all Hellenistic, you know, Hellenism, enlightenment people, um, in the name of them, he made this outright attack on modernity, right. you know, which uh, that's why he, he said maybe the Inquisition was right after all against Galileo, and they didn't let him come in, you know, so he just undid that little progress which had been made to the modern world, he pulled that back again, and right. I think that broke his neck. But together, together with the other things. Uh, well, I didn't know about this, the scandals with the bank, the Vatican yeah, Bank. Yeah, one hanged himself on the bridge in London. Yeah. 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 <coughs> and there's a mafia influence, you know, that must 
yeah. big part of it too. And that's what that one guy said that you know um, Francis is doing so many changes and wants yeah. to modify the bank, change the yeah. bank, and not if the mafia will have anything to do with it. Yeah. And it's well, a dangerous thing. Really? Really? You, <laughs> you have me. You're messing with their money. And then, you know, down the church last Sunday, she said, "I hope they will not pop him off." <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> pop him off. Yeah, well, but I mean, uh, it's, I mean, a very sad story, the whole thing. But uh, because the whole thing is the Mussolini arrangement, you know, mm-hmm. so that means the papacy supported uh, Mussolini, and then came all the others support Hitler, and so, on. and then Mussolini established that church state, and the bank was part of it, but the bank was under Italian law, so mm-hmm. they have to live up to the standards of Italian banking system. And they were never able to do that. Yeah. And when they used to get from one scandal to the other, you know, this one guy hanged himself. I don't know what the others did. It's not the only only scandal. No. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Well, it looks like the Roman Curia is pretty. How does one say? Yeah. Just corrupt to the core. Yeah. Right. So. You know, and it does take someone with. I mean, if Francis can do something about it, if he has the constitution to, to really change it. Yeah. We'll see. Time will but tell. he also knows that it's short. You know, it's also in the seventies already. Mm-hmm. So they can always. Uh, if nobody pops him off, then, <laughs> then he will go <laughs> <laughs> by natural reasons. Right. Such a sad thing, you know. I even I sent you this thing about Malcolm X. You know, all these good people, which have been assassinated. You know, I mean, good people in the sense of liberals. You know, yeah. wanted to make some progressive stuff. They all be popped off. Okay, can we go on? Um, yeah. Can you maybe help me to get those books there? So I let them go through that you can see them too. Okay. That's the last time that you will see them. Which this, one? Just one after the other. You know, whoever sits there can do it. So this one here, that is was our... What is it? Is that the new one? What did I say? What was our next reading? Hegel's Philosophy of History. That is the new one, right? The new reading. Right? Is that true? I think it's true. Why not? Okay, so that would be the reason. So let me say something shortly about this. Um, I wrote about Hegel's philosophy of the family, and I was the first one after his death who did that. And then a Belgium guy in the 80s uh, followed that up. So that's a, some kind of a little unique type of a thing. I gave a talk in Rotterdam to the Hegel Society, International Hegel Society, and there. Uh, I reported on this, and they were very happy that I did this, and we, they celebrated it. So, very simple. Uh, <laughs> let me follow. We know who Hegel is uh, to some extent, right? So he's one of the great idealists, the last one. Kant is the first one. So Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel. And the Frankfurt School people are depending on all of them. They learned also from Fichte, learned a lot of Schelling. Habermas is a Schelling, Schelling guy. Bloch is a Schelling guy. And Tillich, who was very close to them, Paul Tillich, the theologian, he was also a Schelling guy. There would be no critical theory without the Protestant theologian Tillich, because he helped Horkheimer to become a full professor, which was the precondition that he could become the director of the uh, Institute for Social Research. So uh, that's how close they are. And they were close friends, Tillich and Horkheimer. Um, and Adorno did his PhD with Tillich. Did, yeah, that's right, on Kierkegaard, right? Mm-hmm. Right, so, that, right, so, and uh, then Horkheimer would go to New York, you know, and bring bottles of wine when Tillich uh, went on his ship to, to Europe there before the war started. By the way, Tillich never visited Germany again before the war, or during the war, uh, only after the war. He went back, you know, went to the Institute in Frankfurt and gave a speech and so on. So, but Tillich was the theologian, and they thought he was the end of theology. And here, my, our people here in the department had all studied under Tillich. And um, then Mrs. Tillich, the second wife of Tillich, she told them all here, uh, theology is dead. Go into art or go into the science of religion. That's what they did. So we have a direct connection. And he was here, Tillich, and Connie Lowe was his student, and they walked here through the area. And then Tillich asked, what will remain of me? And Connie said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> he said, why? 
Kony said, because Americans cannot think systematically. And so if it is Hegel or Tillich, they cannot think systematically. They, they lose it in the middle. So, um, therefore, but that was not the only reason. The main reason was that Tillich was on the left. And the country was not on the left. It was never on the left. So when Tillich came here, the seminary there in um, the East Coast, what is it, uh, whatever the name Union is, Theological. Union Sy- Theological, yeah. Um, they paid a salary. They cut their own salaries in order to pay uh, Tillich's salary. And so Tillich did not want to hurt his friends. And so he could not introduce himself with the socialist decision. That was his best book, which was written in Seals Marie, where Nietzsche wrote, and thus spoke Zagatustra beautiful place. I went there with Cairn and another friend there. So, um, so this, he forgot about this. So he repressed in such a way that not even Connie Lowe knew it. Nor did uh, uh, Tom Lawson or anybody knew about this. The same way that, as they didn't know that, uh, that uh, the uh, Eliade was a fascist. When I told him this, they didn't believe a word. Then Eliade came and I asked him, I said, where do you stand? The again in right, again in left, and said, of course on the right. He said, further on the right, further on the right. <laughs> he was a wonderful guy, by the way. I mean, civilized, you know, civilized, wonderful teacher, novelist, and so on. So I think, I hope that you got out of our discourse here that we are not looking down on anybody, right? Not the socialists, not the liberals, and not even the fascists. So he belonged to the Iron Guard which in Romania, which killed thousands of Jews, and so on. So, uh, but he traveled to Chicago, and there's this American welding pot, uh, and they put him even together into the same seminar with Tillich. So that is just the American way, you know. Uh, they would have brought Heidegger over here too if if, they, if he had what would have come. So, uh, nevertheless, this um, that is this Hegelian influence, but also uh, his friend Schelling. Now, when Schelling became more positivistic, or what then? The friendship went to uh, didn't last so much. So, but, but Schelling survived Hegel, and he took his chair for ten years in Berlin. But then he became a positivist, really. And then one of his students was Müller, and Müller became the father of the uh, of the science of religion. And his theory was that religion was a perversion of language. So it was really positivistic in the sense studying what is the case and, and so on. So that is the connection and you know who we are, you know what our department was. Some crazy Presbyterians like Miller <laughs> Miller and, and Seibert and Corny Lowe tried to establish a theology department at Western. How they could ever get such an idea it was not has never been clear to me at all. So considering the constitution and the enlightenment tradition of the country. So, but they hired a Jesuit even. Not only that the Jesuit is a theologian and a priest, he is an anti-reformation guy. And this is a Protestant country. So how they ever could do that, you know? And then they used all kinds of dirty tricks to get him out. They didn't give him tenure in spite of the fact that he had written more than anybody else and in spite of the fact that he had more students than anybody else. He had hundreds of students you know, coming to him, even converting. And so then it dawned to them what they had done. You know, and Then they put me instead of him, and we were supposed to work together. They lied to both of us. And then suddenly I replaced him. And then he got angry and said, I voted against him, which was not true. Now he will be canonized. And I told the Jesuits in St. Louis, to, they have to remove that lie first before they can... Uh, you know, they can say thank and you. Then they hired Frank Gross, another Jesuit? Yeah, but he was not an active one. No. He had left the order already. So right. they they hired several priests, but they all had left the priesthood. Yeah. yeah so so that uh, you know, that is the history which is quite quite interesting, you know, the I mean the good heartedness of people and the good they wanted to do and why that was not possible. So uh, Tom Lawson then against Connie Lowe made it into a science of religion thing and um, there was unbelievable fights and shouting and screaming and so on which didn't do good to to the heart of Connie he had a bad heart and so finally he couldn't do it and then they threw him he was vice president he was provost too 
He was the provost title, he was vice president, and they threw him out, and he was deeply wounded by that. So it's amazing what in academia, you know, the politics in academia is a fierce type of a thing. Be all prepared for this. It's not easy. You have to have a thick skin, skin, to um, you know, to survive this. Okay. Nevertheless, that is Hegel there, and uh, this is then on one category. So it's not about the family, not civil society, but it's the category of history now. And uh, history has a certain structure. Reason governs the world. Um, providence governs the world. A, it's always in this uh, triplicity. Uh, B, um, there is a goal to the whole thing, the realm of freedom, the kingdom of God practically. Under B, then there is A, man's freedom nature. Man has this potential to be free, but this potential has to be realized. And it's realized by the agent of change. Then comes the great man theory, which Hegel had, uh, and then others too, uh, the British people, and Tolstoy argued against it. So, um, But he thought that they were a great man, but these great men don't know exactly what they are doing, and they are expressing what everybody wants to do anyway. So they are not so independent as one may think. But uh, um, he saw a great man, Napoleon. He saw Napoleon on the horse, so he saw the agent of the world spirit riding through Weimar while he was looking out of the windows. Then the French army stole whatever he had, and he rescued the phenomenology of spirit and fled to Würzburg, and, and so on. So that was a part of Hegel's story. The same town where he produced this illegitimate son, whom he then forgot. Uh, forgot the philosophers, I forget this. So then uh, the, his mother came, and she was still married at that time. The, the guy, the husband was sick. He owned the house where Hegel lived, and so he went out with his wife and uh, forgot it. But when he married, the idea is later than... Um, she came and brought the little boy and delivered him to, to him. And uh, he, his wife was very surprised. And, uh, but they took him in and they raised him together with three other children. He had a daughter who died, the first child. And then um, the guy, when he was 18 years old, uh, he wanted to study medicine and Hegel thought he was not able to. And so he put him into a store to become a storekeeper or whatever. And it was against the boy's whole nature. And he rebelled and he stole something, 10 cents or whatever. So the father, you know, in his morality was upset and bought him an officer's patent in the Dutch army, colonial army in Indonesia in Decatur. And that is where he went there, and he complained later on that his father didn't even leave the watch to him. Um, so it was the black thing there in the family. And uh, he died in the same year when Hegel died in 1831 from a fever over in Dakota. A very tragic thing. Of course, the Protestant cannot go to confession, so he had to make it up with his creator by himself. But it was a burden in him the rest of his life so uh, so that's little details which, which are important you know too so nevertheless there, there is this freedom nature and that has to be realized so uh, the stoics would say you can be free even as a slave or you can be free in a concentration camp or you can be free on the north side and so on um, abstractly you can be free but this freedom has to be realized you have to put your will into poverty. You have to put your will into a marriage, into business, and so on. It has to be objectivated. Otherwise, it's only subjective, and as such, it isn't there at all. You have sometimes students who cannot make a decision for a girlfriend or for a discipline or whatever, because some people have the feeling, you know, if I make a decision for one girlfriend or for one discipline, sociology or whatever, then I'm not free anymore because I cannot have all the others. But uh, in reality, it is only by making this particular decision that your freedom becomes actual and real. And so, on. so that's an educational type of a thing. Okay, so then, uh, of course, these agents of change, they then transform. They transform the family system, society, 
uh, religion, art, everything is transformed by them, as Napoleon really did. He was an unbelievable transformer. He created a code which is in New Orleans, it's still in action there, so he was much more creative than Hitler was. So, so um, And then um, C is then the stages of development, one way, few are free, all are free. All are free is utopian. It's a utopian Christian or Judeo-Christian or Abrahamic community idea that all people are free and should become free, but there is no place where they are free. Now, Hegel thought that in the European nations this freedom of all had really started. That may be ideological, we have to be careful. With us, the free world today, and that's all taken from Hegel, the free world means really that we have transformed a utopia, the freedom of all, that means no alienation whatsoever, because freedom means the absence of alienation. Freedom means to come home to oneself uh, in solidarity with the others. And the God is free, he goes outside of himself, what Thomas Aquinas had called Exodus, goes outside, outside of himself in creation and the incarnation, and then Reditus, Thomas calls that, goes, comes back to himself again. Then the God is absolutely free. And man also going outside of himself into the world and into God and returns to himself and therefore is free. So that is the notion of freedom which is behind this. And, but that freedom is realized only in stages. So one is free means the king in Africa or in Asia or the, uh, the emperor of Persia or so. And then the Greeks had created the freedom of the few. When Kennedy said, you know, we want to be like the Greeks, he did not know exactly what the Greeks were. These were 4,000 free people in Athens with 100,000 slaves. These 100,000 slaves were considered to be, um, to be slaves by nature, in spite of the fact that they were prisoners of war. So they were slaves by nature, so they had no bad conscience about it. The 4,000, they did communicative action, praxis. The slaves did the work with their hands, instrumental rationality. So that is where the whole division comes between theory and praxis. The, um, the one did the work, and the other one, you know, did the politics in the Ario Park where St. Paul visited. But the um, slaves were not simply nothing. When you go to the Athenian temple, Dustin, you were there already, right? Mm -hmm. On one corner you can see the names of the slaves who built that temple. You see no names at the Empire State Building here in New York, right? In spite of the fact that a lot of them fell down when they built this whole thing, but nobody mentions them. So the slaves, you know, at least they were mentioned. Um, and then later on, of course, the Greeks in general became the slaves in Rome, and carried the whole education of the Roman Empire. You know, the, the most educated people were slaves. So one has to see with slavery. You know, it's a complicated thing. We had here house slaves too, uh, and we had uh, feed, feed slaves, and there was quite a difference in treatment and in feeling and, and well-being and, and so on. Okay, so uh, no, so what, what we what we do here all day long, and we pay a lot of money for this. To, um, to tell people that we are a free country, but we have taken the freedom of all and have transformed it into an ideology, a false consciousness, to legitimate the freedom of the few. And that goes into detail in my discussions with my family about owners. My family really thinks there are no owners, that we are all stockholders. They want to tell me that the owner at a certain point sells his whole stuff in order to become a stockholder instead. Uh, that is ideology. And there you can see the power of this ideology. In order to make us all free, there must be no owners. In spite of the fact that there are owners, nobody is allowed to say that there are owners. Now, little owners, you know, like my lawyer who owns a factory with 50 people, it's a, that little owner, that is okay. But when it goes up to oil and electricity and chemicals and so on, there are suddenly no owners anymore. And so therefore we are a nation of owners because we are stockholders. Maybe 11% are stockholders. But then they take the pensions in and then you have more 
owners, but it's still a minority of owners. So, uh, but the and then they are not visible. The feudal lord was visible. He was riding around with his horse, and he had his uh, castle sitting up there. So the slaveholder was also visible. Uh, they had uniforms or whatever. So, but the capitalist is hiding the guy. One doesn't even know where the country clubs are. Like the Abjan woman there, whose name is on the buildings there, she was going around in tennis shoes in the Volkswagen. You cannot see where they are. So very often they're anonymous. You know, they gave a uh, hundred million. What was it? Hundred million dollars for the medical school, and nobody knows who the hell it is, and so on. So they want to remain hidden because they know people could get angry against the one percent. And when they get angry against the one percent, then you see how the press is doing, uh, you know, mitigating things and say, well, let's not talk about this anymore. Let's talk about something else and so on. So that is the problem, you know, in order to bring, bring about changes. But we don't have to do it, but as long as we know what we are doing, you know, that, that not all are free. This is not true. Uh, it is even the question to what extent the few, be they slaveholders, feudal lords, or capitalists, are really few, are really free. Because if you always know, and they know this in the country club, that you are just 1% and 99% on the other side, that when they get angry someday because the discrepancy of the income, uh, they take you out and mm -hmm. they don't even notice that you're gone. So um, the, the danger there of uh, when you dominate, sit on top of it, you never know when it blows up. When Detroit is burning, like they during the war, when Miami is burning, when New Orleans is, uh, not, not New Orleans, the other one, Los Angeles is burning, and so on. So, uh, therefore, the freedom of the few is a very imperfect type of a freedom. Um, you sit in the country club and say, you know, after me the deluge, let's enjoy the yacht, and, and so on, as long as we can, because it will, will not go on forever. Okay, so that is the structure of this whole thing, this whole book, and uh, the chapters are called it. The first chapter is about right and left, and people say, let's talk about it. Well, there is a right and a left. So with us, it's relatively simple. Every night, all day long, the, the right is the neoconservatives, neoliberals. The left is the Roosevelt liberals. Roosevelt, and first Roosevelt, second Roosevelt, and also you can go to Lord George in England and so on. They all introduce social legislation, uh, health care, and so on and so on. The reason was not that they loved the workers or being merciful or whatever. The reason was that the depression, which was the inventory going to the ceiling, the cars, for instance, and then you could not sell anything anymore. When you could not sell, you had to stop production. Then these people were out of work for 12 years. Then they starved to death. When you came out of the depression and the inventory was down, then half of them had died. When the workforce was down that way, then it was very expensive now. The less workers, the more expensive they are. Price of labor went up. So then also you didn't have enough colonial forces, soldiers, because you have to have cheaper and cheaper labor and resources, and you have to go to the colonies. So you have a colonial army spreading all over the place. Our for, for the First World War was 500,000, and now it's more. They want to bring it down to 450,000 again. They think it's enough to co control the colonies, which is Central America and the Philippines, so and other places. So that um, that is why the social legislation, like health insurance and so on, uh, that is not a, a giveaway, or that the capitalist suddenly becomes merciful or whatever. It's business. The, the workforce has to be down to, let's see, 5%, because you have to have a reserve army, that's called. That means you need a workers' reserve army, which puts pressures on the wage system, so that when somebody comes and says, I will not go to take that job for, for $20 or whatever, and says, oh, he, he whistles, and the others are standing in line already. So you need that in order to put pressure continually on the wage system. It's a reserve army. 6.5% uh, what we have now is too high. So they will go down to 5% if possible. 4.5% would still be okay as a reserve army, would be sufficient. And then, of course, you know, Malthusianism, the workers should only have two children, everybody should replace themselves. It was not possible in the 60s when the ruling class 
uh, put $10 million into the pill production, and they put the whole working class on the pill. Now they have the zero population, and they reproduce exactly. I did. I had seven children. Now I have 14 grandchildren. It's mathematically precise. And each of them made another decision. One didn't marry at all. The other one had just one child. The other one had three children, and so on. So it doesn't matter what they do. They come up with 14. And so it is all over the place. When you see what your grandfather had, grandfather, how many children he had, that was before the pill. Look, whoever, whatever. Had, and, yeah. And look today also what the Catholics have and what the Jews have. And, so, and you'll see they all follow the economic pressure and nobody follows the teaching of their religious community. First mitzvot, multiply, and so on. Uh, they stop multiplying after they have one. So this... Um, uh, that's not a, you know, one can learn from Freud and from Fromm and so on that when you look at the whole realistically at the human species, it's just pitiful. But that you at the same time, you know, recognize the greatness and, and, and the beauty and so on. That is very important because there are misanthropic people um, who hate us. <laughs> I mean, they hate themselves and the whole human species. And But... In, in reality, you know, it is, uh, it looks sometimes pitiful, but it is also unbelievable greatness that they, these organisms are running around there on this miserable globe there, you know, somewhere in the icy coldness and so on, and, and make it, you know, and, and uh, produce those apparatuses and so on. It's just an unbelievable achievement, you know. And I don't know if there's anything like this. They think there must be because of these billions of moons or whatever, uh, and it may be, but you know, it's an amazing thing. So, but uh, Freud saw, you know, the death drive and the libido and, you know, they, they, they crawl around like chimpanzees and so on. But on the other side, there is also this greatness and this dignity, and to hold that together is something Jewish in a certain sense. The Jews on one side saw the world in its total realism, brutal realism, at the same time they held on to the idea and to keep those two things together, and in Christianity that's even pushed to the extreme, uh, to hold that together, that is an amazing type of an accomplishment. Okay, so that between right and left, right, the, the, that's the first chapter, and uh, just read as far as you come. Uh, for us it's relatively simple, but uh, it came up the first time in the National Assembly in, in Paris, the right was the high bourgeoisie, the bankers and the industrialists. The left was the low bourgeoisie. The fourth estate was not in the National Assembly. The low bourgeoisie went to Versailles and, and uh, conquered and burned down the thing. And the low bourgeoisie also killed the, uh, um, killed the I mean, guillotine, the king and the, the dauphin and the, and the, and the, uh, the queen. Um, the high bourgeoisie wanted to have a constitutional monarch like in London, and they didn't come through the low bourgeoisie did. Low bourgeoisie are the fathers of the fascism. You know, the fascists are an imitation of that low bourgeoisie, this guillotining type of a low bourgeoisie. Uh, so, and, and when we have fascism, we get fascism here, you have to, that the middle class there, which they talk about all the time. Uh, that means farmers and high school teachers and um, uh, well-paid workers, car factory workers and so that's the low middle class, and you have lots of them around here. The unions here think they created the low middle class. That means the, you know, the well paid workers. Otherwise, it's the carpenters and the blacksmiths and so on. They are something medieval, and in modernity and civil society, they feel threatened. They feel threatened from below by the unions and from above by the big corporations. You can see it on the mall down there, right? They get subvention, they get tax relief, and, and so on, but it doesn't help. They stay there for three years, you know, have a bookstore. First year it works well, second year it goes down. They have to pull the prices down, and the third year they disappear. And so they are threatened, you know, by minimum wage, they are threatened, right? They are threatened by Obama health care because they cannot pay the health insurance for their, for their employees. Big guy can do that, you know. But the little guys, it's very hard. So, so since they are a threatened species, they are the first ones to accept that fascist thing. They cannot do anything if they are not paid by the 1%. So 
So if the 1% is threatened by class envy and so on, they will pay those low bourgeois characters. As I think they are, have been active in Kiev there, I think, uh, including the anti-Semitism and so on. Okay, and then it became a religious thing, and you can see that everywhere too when you talk with people. When people think, you know, that everything is historical, but Jesus or Moses and Muhammad and so on, that would be on the right. Uh, if you have people who think that everything is a myth, that Jesus is a product of the community, you know, made it up, that would be the left. Uh, trees was one, one of 1900, we thought Jesus hadn't existed. It is not accepted any longer. So you have today a king who would say, you know, some of it is historical, or, you know, the other students of uh, myths and so on, some of it is historical, and some of it is myth, and they hold on to the historical, and then interpret, you know, the myth in terms of linguistics and so on. So that is the meaning of right and left, and that would be the first chapter. Okay, what time do we have now? Uh, about 8.30. 30. 8.30. So we want to look at some of those movies there about the fascist thing. Um, let me just look through some of these books there. You can give it to me, and then I, I take it over to you there, so very shortly. So. Here is this Eric from The Dogma of Christ. That is an application of Freud and Marx to the development of Christianity. And it's an excellent type of book. So it takes from Marx the, um, the class analysis in Judaism and so on, and then looks at the lower classes. The Sermon on the Mount becomes a rebellion of the slave class, or the lowest class in, in Israel and so on. So a combination of Marx and Freud that is from here is this book which I mentioned before workers and uh, so blue color and bright color workers at the evening of the Third Reich so here uh, from uh, employed already his um, uh, transformation of Freud what, I, what we just mentioned so he's not so biological anymore he emphasized the cultural factors and the social factors instead of the biological factors and um, that was only in 1980 it was finally produced. But from this, something else came. Adorno made a study of the authoritarian personality in the labor unions, and the result was so bad that it could not be published. So it is in the uh, inheritance of, uh, what is this name, uh, Löwenthal. Löwenthal has it in his um, papers there in Los Angeles still, um, but they were never allowed to publish it. This was published, and Adorno used it then again in, with other colleagues in the book The Authoritarian Personality, which you have in the, in the library here, and uh, there is one part is written by Adorno, and the Authoritarian Personality was, uh, was applied there. That means authoritarian personality on one side, that's the fascist personality, and the revolutionary personality on the other side, that is the socialistic personality. When Fromm came over here, he called the socialist personality, or revolutionary personality, the democratic personality. And he changed authoritarian personality sometimes into consumer personality or market personality and other names, so there were certain transformations. The last time that was used was in Mexico. In a village in Mexico, it was applied there to a study in the 70s. So it made history, but it was repressed for a long time. Franklin School was not happy with it, and Fromm didn't come through with it because he had revised Fromm too much, in the sense as we mentioned it today. Here's the heart of man there. That is another thing. Um, Genius for good and evil, so psychology, uh, man, wolf, or sheep. You know, remember that Hitler was called the wolf, the wolf, and the wolf's chances, the, uh, his headquarters, it is uh, there. So here you can find things about this uh, whole struggle about the animal instincts and what to do with them. Here's the art of loving. Eric Fromm, that has 25 million copies were published of this. And the main thesis is that loving is an art. So that there are many types of love. So um, people are so enthusiastic about love, 
in spite of the fact that it goes so wrong so often. So that is the problem which Fromm wants to solve. So he thinks that it has love has to be learned like one learns medicine. Medicine is an art too and a science. So, and as you have to start slowly to learn anatomy and physiology and so on, so also you have to learn love step by step by step. And then you become a real good lover or you don't. And for from you know, that people just jump into it and say all day long, I love you, I love you, and don't know exactly what they mean. So um, progress is all the Greeks have these different types of love and um, then all of May and so on, they used it too. So when you meet somebody, it can be on the level of anonymity, this love of anonymity, you know nothing about her, not even her name or where she comes from. You just meet her and uh, somehow her sexual uh, aspects attract you, but that is also that anonymous love. Then comes uh, the projection love. You see a woman and then the idea of your first lover, your aunt or your mother and so on, you project it on this person and then you are struck and suddenly that is the woman of your life and so on. Then when the diapers are coming and so on, then of course the projection goes to pieces and then you say, you cheated me, you pretended to be somebody else and so on and so on. Of course, he was never somebody else but someone projected on it. Another level is the erotic one where it's much freer one than the others where you are fascinated by the beauty of somebody. It rests on that beauty and that beauty may be there sometimes, sometimes not. If there is a toothache or so, the thing disappears. Sometimes the beauty is there in the evening, it's completely gone in the morning and so on. So it's a very vacillating type of a thing, but it is real among students and maybe uh, a lot of cases. Then there is the personal love where you say um, it's you as this single person. Maybe you have an aunt who had a lover in the Second World War and then she uh, he died and she never married again and so on because she thinks this one guy and if she would take another one she would think that this would be a betrayal for not for the old one but for him because it could never be like it was this singular thing there and then for religious people there's a sacramental uh, thing there that like <coughs> God and the world or Christ and the church and so on, that is a mystical type of thing. So that is the art, loving of art, which was a tremendous success. Uh, then dialogue here between, the dialogue between him and so on, where he also explains uh, the um, the whole uh, Freudian, when he goes, how far he goes over uh, beyond Freud and so on, so we can look at this there. And... Uh, and that's not even all. He, he was unbelievable. In spite of his illness, he was tremendous uh, productive. So, encounter with Marx and Freud. We talked about this, and there's, uh, we have to see that there are others. Reich uh, is important too. He did the same thing. Marcuse did the same thing. Evolution of hope, um, then what to do with technology, if it could be humanized, and so on is another book again beyond Freud and beyond Marx. Um, we discussed already the problem of anxiety which is by Freud himself. Uh, Eric Fromm, The Forgotten Language is very similar to the book of Freud on dreams. So he thinks that the language in our dreams, the language in fairy tales and myth and so on, that this is the same language and that it's universal that all people speak that language. Here is um, the, the early on he wrote an article already on uh, criminality, uh, criminology, and so he made a contribution to criminology and, and so on, and the state as an educator through punishing and so on, the state educates. Okay, that is it, and then um, at least we have them up here for a long time, Psychoanalysis in a Crisis. That is the book where he criticizes Marcuse because Marcuse was not a clinical psychoanalyst, he was too much a philosopher. In the 50s he admired uh, uh, Marcuse because he was a philosopher, and then when Marcuse became famous and so on, then he criticized him because he was distorting Freud, he was in philosophical terms. And then the pathology of normalcy, that also goes back to Freud, you know that uh, when you miss for instance, you somehow you put up another word than you intend, 
then your unconscious expresses itself. So there are these everyday anormalities uh, which we have for getting things and so on. That is all in this one. And this is by Frank by Funk here, who is his famous student, and he will be even... Oh, that we can put there. Um, Funk will have an article right in this, yeah. which comes out in April, it hopefully. April, yeah. Okay. Very good. So that's all. Now let's uh, take one uh, out there. Uh, the last time, remember, we talked about this woman, the secretary. Then we saw the secretary in the movie um, about Hitler. The last days there. Where, where is it? It has. Is it still there? In Trouble. Yeah. Remember, we had the Life last days of Hitler. Oh, the the bunker. Yeah. Where, where did yeah, that show? Yeah. Oh, you still have it there. Well, should we uh, go to this again or not? Or should we may maybe leave that behind, right? Yeah. But let's take another one when the good old times were still going on, and that is this one here. Mm. Conspiracy, that is the one say, one say experience. I don't know if you ever heard about one say. It fits together, yeah. It fits, I was there too. I gave a speech even in the house where this opposite to yeah. that, which there was so. That's what I did too. <laughs> so, um,. So let's have that one say a few uh, things of it, and then we can move on. Um, what happened at one say? So the Jewish thing, which we mentioned several times today, went through different stages. So one stage was when Hitler came to power, he had to bring his economy up. But the American Jews at the East Coast boycotted German products. So then he got in contact with the Zionists and he made a deal with the Zionists which is called the Transfer Agreement. This Transfer Agreement said that Germany would pay 25,000 marks for every Jew who would go to Palestine in the kibbutz there. And so Hitler paid that for several years. And we have people here in town who uh, took advantage of that. So Anna, my friend, she went to Palestine. Um, so that was a solution. Then there were transports of children up to 1939. Baum, my friend, he was shipped out. So where uh, rich people here paid the Nazis, and they then let thousand children or what go to London, and then they went sent to Canada and so on. So that was another thing. There was the idea to send them to Madagascar, which is a little lost island in the Mediterranean. There was a movie on it recently, beautiful esoteric plants and animals still. Uh, we, the anti-Jewish people here, wanted to send the Jews to Alaska, Alaska there. So there was a similar plan. So, and then the more the war uh, uh, increased and came to the point of uh, the Japanese attack. When the Japanese attacked, that was when the point was reached where the international uh, finance, Judaism, uh, finally had put, uh, produced another world war. And that is where Hitler had prophesied. That will not be the end of, the, of the Europe, but the end of the Jewish race. Then it intensified. Then this happened here, uh, uh, the conspiracy movie. So now we know historically where we are. That means Heydrich there, who was assassinated a few weeks later, and Eichmann there, who was later on tried in Jerusalem, uh, they brought about a meeting of government officials of all departments of the German government. Hitler was not there. Hitler never signed on on this. Hitler was in the Wolfschanz in East Prussia or in Kiev, where he had a dacha. So um, they, they had put his government in the hands of other people in Berlin. And that is where it was done, so that even the guy from his headquarter did not know about this plan. So uh, that is a very peculiar thing. But now we'll see where this final solution started. Namely, not only castration, like we had with black people in Virginia, but where the gassing starts, right? Before they were shot and killed, and then also gassed in little wagons with Volkswagen gas. But this is a systematic thing then with IG Farben's product of Cyclone B of uh, Fritz Haber, the gas war father would use that too as an anti-insecticide uh, to kill insects and um, the cyclones were all insecticides but 
cyclone B was used in the camps then. So that was decided here. So that was a Jewish house there, beautiful Jewish uh, bourgeois home that the bourgeoisie has made it in Berlin. And uh, by the winter of 1942, now we are in that house there. They made it a bit louder. And America had entered the war. For the first time, Hitler's dream of a German empire to last a thousand years was in doubt. While he hired oh. and fired generals... Which was the South and South of Berlin, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. 15 of his 20 minutes on the train. There is the Fiedler Storch, that is called. <laughs> Artillery <laughs> observer. <laughs> and Heidrich <laughs> flies in that. He flies it himself. And down there is the house, and he lands there. That is the one say. So he flies over the one say and lands in the backyard of the house. That was the wonderful thing with that airplane. You could land it everywhere. That is the house. Yeah. See, there's a Jewish industrial, so that's a Jewish high finance, which was in these houses. The whole thing's a museum now. Yeah, right. Enough for four hours, sir. Too many. Yes, Two I can't. That should be sufficient. So there's the bourgeois kitchen. You have to think that Nazis are bourgeois, right? They are low bourgeois, imitating the high bourgeoisie. They are all the servants. Do we have enough? Justin, can you give How me many my cells? water? I am sure we have a sizable inventory. Uh, I know it's down there. I don't mind the cross. Keep his. Make it a separate portion. Keep him where I don't see him. Oh, that's how Father Sosa's and goes. Smile. 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 So these are the SS uniforms. All right, then. They are real. That looks smart. culture means, right? And we have some nice houses here in Kalamazoo, but they don't come close to this. And that is the Volkswagen there, which was transformed into a Jeep. And the wonderful thing with it was that it didn't have water cooling. So it was used in Russia um, because it couldn't freeze. No silence in Latvia. No so he's the governor of Latvia. Latvia, you know, the, the Baltic Berlin. states. They were sometimes Russian, sometimes German. They had great German sympathies. Now they are Russian again. Now they have been freed again, by the way. They are again independent again. Hitler? We've met, Colonel. Indeed we have. I'm State Secretary Buller. Indeed you are. Mm -hmm. Mr. Langer. Hitler. If there's anything any of you gentlemen need, please don't hesitate to call an orderly or me. My appreciation to the man who picked this spot it would be General Halley. So this is based on <laughs> one copy. They all had to destroy the copies, but one didn't of the procedure. And that is on which the movie was built. Come a long way. Man a drink. This way, gentlemen. I'm sure you'll find the wine. Of course, we are going to the wine first thing. Look at the beautiful staircases and the beautiful architecture. So everything has to be secret, nothing should remain of it. So they did have a bad conscience about the whole thing. It was a private company. Private company, yes. Who believed it was owned by a Jew. There's some dispute. Well, in the SS, we traveled it off. Mercedes is. That was the best car. That's an S S man. As a S A man, right? So there was the S S, which is the middle class, and the S A was more working class. Ah, the East is well represented. 
And we're here first. Well, it was in the east where the death camps were built. He made you like a very tired man. No, please, I am enjoying these surroundings. So can I make an ice cream, please? Sir, follow me, sir. By their laughter, you can know things, even in our universities there. There is a laughter which uh, shows humanity, and there is a laughter which shows animality. I have here another copy of the Circumstance General Hydrate, who would like to be refreshed of its content. He doesn't know exactly what it's all about. So when one talks about totalitarianism, one thinks they are all yes. equal and the same. In reality, under the cover, there were tremendous tensions between the SA and the SS and the SS and the Army and the Army and the civilians. Here we are. And how are you? Very well, thank you. I'll make sure that the general. And when will the general arrive? On the By the way, Eichmann never, uh, never, uh, you know, repented, or what? None of the Nazis, as such, repented about that uh, this was a bad thing, or whatever. There he comes, the pizza is shot. See, it could land everywhere. It thought it was a car. So that is Eichmann. He was killed three months later, I think, in Prague by uh, partisans. Yeah, and they took uh, fled into a church, and so the church was implicated. No, no. And they had a four year plan, so several four year plans. And that is the representative of Hitler's Chancellery in Berlin. starving in Germany, but they live well. He is the guy who uh, did the Jewish laws, the Nuremberg laws. He is the constructor of the Nuremberg laws. Yeah, the general got a heart attack before Berlin and for Moscow. That's the SA there. Look at this. There you see the ex proletarian against the other, didn't trust each other. But most of them had the doctorate, they all had the doctorate, most of them had the doctorate title, yeah. I read the Cotton Briefing, we have this general who is now trying to capture Moscow, who has never commanded one damn brigade, that is what I've been hearing, and that is why I played. So is there beer? Yes. And where is the boys' room? I have been briefed by the Governor General. He's a little sexually perverted guy. The SA was under suspicion to have homosexuals, and uh, that was taken as a reason to decimate them in Munich. That was the night of the long night. There was also a priest who was a friend of Hitler, Father Leo, was also accidentally killed by the SS, and Hitler cursed the damned SS. They have killed my dear Father Leo.
No good news if it's all round. Cold. What? Cold. It must be cold. You know it's how cold it is in Latvia. I see wine, but just uh, no beer. And what are these? A cigar, sir. Please. Uh, Neumann, director, office of the four year plan. Gruta. Excuse me. Uh, sir, this is. Um, don't Max. take it. Don't the, take uh, it. Don't take it. A close assistant to Vice Marshal Goering. Neumann, I introduce Dr. Klopfer, a close associate of the Brown Eminence. Um, Brown, excuse me. I represent Martin Bormann, the party chairman of the thousand year plan. Bormann's son has become a priest in the meantime. Hey, Hitler! Hey, Hitler! Dr. Krittinger here? Yes, he is. That's the release. Herr Hitler? Herr Hitler? Hello, Hitler. Are they on the way? Not yet, sir. Who's late? We are. Now comes Hagley. Blue eyes, blonde hair. Superman, but he was under suspicion also to be a little bit Jewish. There he is. The pizza short man. Where they take all these old cars from for the for the movies, isn't that amazing? Yeah. Must go up the museum. I love this house. There he is, see? The air is appreciated the architecture. Are we ready? Absolutely. And after the war, this will be my home. Converted. And then, um, 
There were papers, these are for you alone. No a, a Protestant nun, he was hit yes. by a bombing attack a in his courtroom, and the uh, Protestant nun, so whose brother he had sent to death, him. was the last one to take care of him.
Yes. Yes, I'm sure if you call his office, you... Yes. Yes. Heil Hitler. This meeting is not taking place. You are to take no phone calls for anyone at this meeting. Anyone. Okay, that's all for today. And you won't. Have a nice way, right? And then we didn't meet next Wednesday. We meet two weeks from today. Very good. Enjoy it. Fully. Oh, yeah, spring break next week? Yeah. Can you turn the normal thing on? Mm -hmm. okay, thank you.